So good morning, good morning everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, to this uh, uh, event today to launch the Tallinn guidelines on national minorities and the media and the digital age. And the digital age. Uh, thank you also to the hopefully many uh, people who are following this event online and we will have a, also a possibility to interact uh, with us during, uh, during the discussion. Uh, Madam President, Foreign Minister, uh, we are very uh, pleased, we are honored, in fact, to have you here for the opening of this uh, uh, event today. I, I still uh, remember, Madam President, the discussion we had uh, it was this, the Maritime Museum, where we had a dinner during the Leonard Atlantic Conference, and, uh, and we were discussing uh, the, the work we are starting to do on developing uh, uh, the guidelines with the support of uh, many uh, eminent experts. And, and we were thinking that Tallinn is, in a way, the digital capital of Europe, and as a country that has its own experiences uh, with minorities, would be a very appropriate venue, and, uh, and not only for uh, placing the event, but also for leaving its, its name on the, on the guidelines. So thank you, thank you very much, uh, Madam President, Mr. Minister, for your support for this event. And, and uh, 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 maybe before uh, developing further the concept, I would like to uh, ask you to open this, uh, this discussion with a few um, introductory considerations. Madam President, thank, thank you. Thank you, and really, High Commissioners, and I cannot thank you enough for having uh, indeed uh, named these guidelines after Tallinn. And I know it's win-win because if it's if it's digital, then if you have Estonia or Tallinn somewhere, then people uh, realise that this means business. People who are close to the subject matter have obviously been participating. But you know, for us, it is also. Um, uh, your recognition that uh, we've had a long relationship during the last 30 years and, and, uh, and it has always not been very easy. And I just come from the meeting with Estonian local governments and I was also very proud to tell them that this is also the recognition of our achievements on how to bring different, uh, different communities closer to each other. And I, I, I would like to stress closer, we are not seeking to merge, we are seeking to have a close, uh, closeness, uh, friendliness, cosiness. I just come from African Union meeting and they say always they are friends and brothers and I think that's, that's also felt in the air there that uh, the atmosphere, the this friendliness, this we hand, give hand to each other, we help each other. This is also very much here, present here in Tallinn, and, and I see this as an elegant recognition of our progress over the last uh, 30 years um, as well. And, uh, and I'm really extremely grateful for, for this. And uh, we also still have a lot of work to do, of course. Uh, we need to continue to uh, make sure that uh, also in the internet, uh, our own language, develops, as, as is also in the guidelines, uh, countries are invited to, uh, to make sure their languages uh, are developed, also in the digital sphere, how to promote, uh, what, is, uh, what is nice to do, what is not so nice to do. I think it's all very, uh, very uh, well precisely put together, but uh, of course it is not prescriptive, and this is also what I appreciate about this guidance. It's not prescriptive, it, it's a food for thought, and, and everybody can find a uh, a lot to think uh, here about it. I'm also proud to say that Estonian language, if you consider Estonian proportion uh, in, uh, in the world, Estoni Estonian speakers proportion, we are 10 times overrepresented in the internet, which means that uh, you can do a lot of beneficial work uh, online to make sure that your language and culture is not annihilated or overtaken by bigger cultures, but, uh, but it is really supported by, uh, by the digital environment. Uh, as a well, president of a proud European Union member state country, I think it's our obligation because having opened the job market uh, in Europe for everybody to live and work everywhere, absolutely everywhere, it, it's quite clear that uh, uh, giving out this kind of uh, permission to people, you have to support it with, uh, with, uh, with your state action, which means, yes, I want Estonians to work in Spain, in Italy, in France, and elsewhere, and, and Finland, of course, but I have an obligation to follow them online with uh, our own language, culture, education uh, methods and models. And I hope Estonia will continue pioneering also uh, this um, kind of, kind of uh, thinking. I also believe that digital is a wonderful equalizer. It does indeed give even the smallest, smallest groups, smallest nations, uh, more dispersed people, 
a common ground where they can come together because geography is there, as we know already uh, uh, now. And in internet, everybody has, uh, has a lot of uh, options, uh, possibilities, which means that we need to continue developing uh, computer literacy. And, and also, I think we need to continue demanding that uh, those who uh, uh, provide us with digital services, and mostly they are private sector companies, that they do think of multilingualism and, uh, and, uh, and the variety of culture more and more. And Estonia is also an uh, observant member of the Francophonia organization, international organization. It's not just because uh, we like French, actually, there are very few French speakers in Estonia. Uh, and, uh, but, but it is because we believe that if the digital tools become flexible enough to, uh, to during conversation, during writing, to smoothly move from one language <coughs> to another between big languages, then the added cost is not too big to make sure that this also continues to happen in, uh, in the smaller language environments. And I think this is also something which we need to work with and, and make sure that uh, will happen. And there is another challenge. There are languages which are almost ex uh, extinct. There are languages uh, in which you cannot go to school today. I think uh, making sure that they also have a digital footprint is extremely important and the new way to preserve the cultural uh, richness of our, our world globally. There are indeed very tiny languages. I mean, in, uh, in, in Vanuatu, I think they speak 120 and their population is quarter of a million. So <coughs> you see, we have a lot of work to do to make sure that uh, digital really uh, represents the uh, wonderful global culture, what we have an analog world. Thank you for listening and thank you all for being here. Thank you, Madam President. <laughs> Mr. Uh, hey, very good morning to everyone and thank you, High Commissioner, Madam President. Uh, um, I'm very happy that, uh, that the High Commissioner and his office uh, have chosen Tallinn as the as the place to launch the guidelines. Uh, I think it's very fitting and it's also a, a great opportunity to get, get us all together. Um, when uh, the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe was founded uh, now almost 45 years ago, just uh, uh, more or less 80 kilometers to the north from here, um, it was, uh, it, it, it realized, it, it, it recognized that human rights actually are a, a, a very vital and very important part of, of security, both, uh, both within countries but also internationally. Uh, this place here, this venue uh, where we are today has a very rich military and industrial uh, history, but today it's emerging as a, as a um, cultural hub, uh, the, the, the center of the artisan community, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a place that has very rich uh, nightlife also, and, 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 and as such it's a place to enjoy tolerance and diversity, uh, also offline actually, <laughs> which is uh, somewhat unusual for, uh, for, for, for Estonia these days. Uh, for Estonia it's very important that the human rights are protected both uh, online and offline, and, 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 and we believe uh, very much also in the, in the access to internet as a sort of human right already. And, 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 we, and we believe that it, it comes with a lot of uh, uh, opportunities as well as, as, as obviously uh, certain responsibilities. Uh, access to the information online has been a great uh, uh, enabler for, for making societies more equal and, and, and providing communities uh, with, uh, with, with access not only to information but also vital, vital, vital services. Uh, the information society, uh, or in the information society, I believe we need to have critical thinking to learn how to navigate between different uh, platforms. And, and uh, as Madam President already said, uh, uh, media literacy here and, and uh, digital literacy is a very important, uh, very important component uh, of, of, of that. There are massive amounts of information. Uh, the the uh, amount of information uh, that we have access to today uh, is uh, not uh, not twice or three times the amount that 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 we could access just uh, a couple of generations ago. It's thousands of times, and and it's uh, therefore also the the duty of governments to to protect the uh, the that that uh, vastly expanded informational space. Uh, the launch of guidelines in Tallinn uh, is, is, is the result of very good cooperation uh, that we have ha enjoyed uh, with, with your office, High Commis Commissioner, and yourself. And I know that you are no stranger to Tallinn, having been here uh, 
uh, twice, and I'm very happy also that you are, have this time, uh, even though the roads are slippery, uh, to, to, to see around a bit. Uh, Estonian authorities obviously uh, invest a lot of energy and a lot of resources into the integration of minorities, and I think that we've, we've, we have achieved a considerable success and considerable progress uh, over, over, over the years. And we, we believe that the integration of minorities is obviously the responsibility of the states in which the minorities reside. Uh, it's, it's also natural that, that uh, uh, the uh, countries where those uh, minorities originate uh, feel special affinity to them, and, and, as, and, and we do to Estonian expatriate community. Obviously, the, the uh, internet uh, provides also new opportunities, new, new, new chances to, to communicate with, with our expatriates abroad, and, uh, and, and we, we believe that, that this interaction should be done in such a way as not to not to undermine the integration efforts of the countries in which the minorities reside. Um, the role of multilateral organizations, despite certain limitations, is, is to be a forum for dialogue and, uh, and foster the process where we can reiterate our values and principles. And, and we believe that, that strong independent overseer institutions obviously strengthen the, 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 the work of the organization as a whole. And, and, and we believe that your office, High Commissioner, plays an outstanding role in, in early warning and conflict pre prevention and, and, and democracy uh, building and promotion. Uh, the world is a very complex place these days and, and, and becoming increasingly more, 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 more complex. We very much believe that, that we need to invest what we can into preserving and, and, and in the, uh, strengthening the, the multilateral rules-based uh, international order and, and the uh, freedom of media, the, the, the freedom of information is actually very, very important, uh, very important enabler and, and, and also a very important principle here. Uh, so so I, I believe that it's a extremely timely and topical and, 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 and worthwhile effort to, to introduce uh, some rules and guidelines that are in nature uh, universal, universal and, and should, should guide us in, in our efforts in, in that direction. Thank you very thank much. You, thank you, Minister. And let me, um, having listened to, to both of you, may, may put forward a few considerations from my, from my perspective. Uh, first of all, our office is not uh, new to this, uh, uh, to this area. We have uh, some, some guidelines on the use of minority languages in broadcast media go back to 2003. But, <coughs> but of course, the very uh, fast evolution, if you want, of, of the media world uh, and, and the, now the digital angle uh, really uh, uh, pushed us to relook at them. Uh, so the, the Tallinn guidelines are in a way building over uh, the, uh, the older ones. They're updating them and they uh, strive to uh, uh, keep them relevant in, uh, uh, in, the, new, in the new environment. Um, as, we, as we focus to, uh, to minorities, and the guidelines, maybe I should add, um, are a very, uh, how can I say, practical tool uh, for us to, to operate in an environment that is overall rather divisive. And we see this very clearly in the, in the OSC, where even the space of the dialogue is, is shrinking, and the room for decision making uh, is also becoming increasingly uh, um, constrained and limited. Um, so the, the guidelines that are based on uh, uh, practical experience, on lessons learned, uh, that look at best practices here and there, uh, and, and also in this, in this case, uh, we would look at Estonia and your own best practices also when it comes to, to implementing them, are a good way for us to avoid a cumbersome and potentially difficult decision-making process. Uh, but then, because they are based on, uh, um, on, on these uh, good models that we see on the ground, because are based and, and draw on the expertise of, of uh, uh, um, uh, recognized uh, um, uh, uh, experts that have been uh, working for a long time on these issues and, uh, and uh, agree to share their expertise with us, become an authorita authoritative tool uh, for us to uh, pursue our policies and to put forward concrete recommendations to uh, countries with, uh, uh, with which we operate. Um, uh, Focusing now on the, on the minorities, and I would say it's, it's not only minorities related because our societies are becoming fragmented in so many ways in these days, and this uh, applies more broadly to uh, issues of uh, uh, integration of societies at large. Um, and uh, the, 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 
you said, Madam President, the digital space becomes a powerful equalizer and is empowering also smaller groups, which is, uh, which is very true and which is very good because it, it gives a space for also for minorities and for, for smaller groups uh, to uh, um, uh, express themselves, to put forward their own, uh, 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 their own considerations, their own thoughts, uh, to interact with each other, uh, regardless also of uh, uh, geographic bounds. So there is also uh, a, a transnational uh, uh, element of this. Um, which, is, uh, uh, which is in itself uh, uh, very positive, but which also may contain dangers. And as we are looking now at the new, uh, uh, the new way of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, developing relations and also uh, the new kinds of crises and conflicts that arise, uh, that are very different from uh, what we used to, so, to see and, uh, and what has become also the source of our own policies to prevent them, we need to be creative also in, uh, in developing new ways to counter the risk of conflict, including uh, conflict that might be fostered uh, through uh, initiatives in the digital space. Um, so this makes it very difficult uh, to find a line between uh, guaranteeing uh, that right to freedom of expression, which, which is very much at the basis of everything we do here, uh, but also ensuring that there is no misuse in a way and that there are certain rules, certain principles. Uh, for us, uh, one key element uh, remains that, uh, uh, of course, countries uh, uh, should and we have some, some specific guidelines on that. We call them Bolzano Boards and Guidelines, which is the relationship uh, between countries with regard to uh, the, the respective minorities on each other's uh, territory. And this applies also to the, the, digital, uh, the digital sphere. Uh, but uh, for us, the key element is that any intervention should not complicate the processes of integration of minorities. You, Madam President, have seen that you have reached out uh, very concretely to some of your uh, minority groups here, by including by being present yourself uh, in the northeastern uh, uh, regions and, and uh, uh, engaging more closely also with uh, parts of your society uh, on which the work of integration, for which the work of integration is very, is very important. Perhaps you could pu put forward some considerations on the role of the media and, and also in the digital space in that perspective of, uh, um, in a way, reaching, reaching out and being seen as, as reaching out and providing tools, which are language tools, education, and, and of course these are all important elements of a larger puzzle that builds a, a stronger integration, uh, integration policy. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed, I strongly believe that uh, these guidelines, by the way, will be very useful also to big internet companies because you, we can see that our big internet companies globally are, well, trying to grasp what exactly is what we, with what we are not happy here and what we are trying to change and, and what we as politicians are trying to achieve. And to put it very shortly, this is what we want to do is, is that uh, we want to tell our people that we as politicians and responsible, uh, responsible leaders of any nation, we, despite the fact that we have differences of opinion, our general objective is always the well-being and the development of, uh, of our own countries and, and globally peace and security. It gets lost and, and it actually narrows the space of a politician to have a, have a debate and an open debate about different options and opportunities to work towards these goals. And that is also why me personally, uh, everybody here in Estonia knows that I'm a, a national conservative by my, uh, my, uh, my political predisposition, social liberal though. But I am reaching, my, my, my space to have different debates is limited to actually hugging all nations. I, as a president of this country, cannot do much more anymore than, I mean, go and preach what has been actually uh, these, these rafts which have been actually well created into the society by uh, these uh, divisive bubbles, what we have also in social media, but not only on social media, also in uh, public media and political processes in general, because the effect is, is, is also coming in the, into the analog world. I mean, if it's nice to be rude in, uh, in, uh, in internet, it becomes nice to be rude also on the street. And it narrows our space to debate. 
And this is not good, and this is what I think I want to also uh, tell uh, to our own people. Despite the fact that we have differences of opinion, you cannot label us as traitors, you cannot label us as somebody who doesn't care about the Estonian uh, culture just because we also care about the other people globally. And, uh, and this is something which uh, I see as, uh, as an important um, uh, thing to do. These guidelines need to be given also to big internet companies and told them that we, politicians, want our space for critical debate back, but for that they need to have more breaching debate online. Because right now, I mean, they are at the one end, and I am strictly sitting at the other end, yes. alone. And I cannot anymore debate critically. I only can hawk people. This is also not good. I want my right as a critical debate maker in this country back as well. And this is, I think, uh, quite an important message uh, nowadays, also coming from this guideline. Thank you, thank you, President, for this debate. Can I put Minister Mixer on the spot one moment? You, you presented the foreign policy priorities of, of Estonia yesterday in Parliament. Um, uh, we are looking at the United Nations now as a platform uh, to uh, have a bit of a, uh, how can I say, innovative debate with regional organizations supporting the UN Chapter 8, etc. cetera, uh, to look at uh, new ways of preventing conflict taking into account the changed nature of conflict themselves, and focusing on uh, uh, strengthening the cohesion uh, of, of societies to make them more resilient to conflict, for us, is a key element. And guidelines such as this <coughs> will play a key role in, in this. In July, we're planning an event uh, in the margins of, uh, of uh, a, a high-level uh, conference on, on sustainable development. Uh, uh, to draw attention to this, inviting regional organizations. Can Estonia help us and uh, come and bring its own experiences also there uh, to, to uh, uh, look at how success, uh, successful policies of integration uh, can uh, strengthen the cohesion of the society? I, I very much uh, believe we, 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 we can. And actually, also within the UN framework, we have been promoting the more preventive mindset. And obviously, pre the, the, the more preventive mindset consists of uh, a wide variety of different uh, components or elements. And, and, and part of that is actually making societies more resilient. Resilience in physics, I, I believe I'm not a... I, I don't know much about physics, but it's, it's basically the, the, the quality of, of, uh, of objects to respond sort of asymmetrically to shocks. And I think it's very important to, 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 to be shock resistant as a society in order to, in order to survive those very uh, violent uh, shocks that we occasionally experience in, in, in all parts of the world. Uh, and and um, I think that uh, also Estonia is a very uh, rel uh, relatively advanced uh, digital society has a special interest in promoting, uh, I, I was mentioning the rules-based world order, uh, promoting the, the sort of rules-based global information space or, or, or digital space. And, and uh, Madam President has been a great uh, uh, leader in, 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 in those efforts globally. Uh, we have uh, actually all, all successive governments who have been working very, very, very hard to promote the idea that we should be uh, better able to to uh, govern the or the, or the or create international law that would apply to 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 the digital digital uh, world as well, and uh, it's it's not uh, something that is unique to Estonia. Even much less digitally developed societies face the same problems because we are seeing two contradictory trends with the with the emergence of global digital society. Uh, the first is actually the universal access to internet, uh, in information. But, but while the amount of information available has exploded over the past uh, couple of decades, the, the uh, capacity of the, the absorptive capacity of an individual has not grown. And that has allowed uh, us to, to create very personalized uh, information bubbles and eco chambers. And that actually gives, uh, gives an opportunity to those who would like to split our societies along uh, very different lines. And for example, uh, over the past several months, there has been a lot of discussion about uh, the role that so certain social media platforms might have played in, in fostering the, 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 the conflict in as distant, geographically distant 
place as, as, as Myanmar, for example. And uh, so I think that we, we should really pay a lot of attention to, to how we do not uh, limit people's access to information, how we do not actually restrict uh, freedom of, 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 uh, of uh, in, in information, uh, but, but how we actually govern, in, uh, govern the digital uh, world by, by universal rules that everyone is actually morally but also legally obliged to follow. Okay, President Karulaid, uh, Mr. Mixer, thank you very much for joining us for the opening of the event. I would like to take one final minute to show everybody the explanations we have developed uh, just to illustrate the key points of the guidelines. It's literally one minute. Then we'll have a picture all together and, uh, and we'll continue with the panel and the discussion. Please. Diverse societies require space for inclusive and pluralistic interaction and debate. <coughs> Media and information technologies can offer such spaces to allow different groups to interact with each other, explore their identities, and voice diverse perspectives without fear. This fosters dialogue and mutual understanding, strengthens societal integration and resilience, and reduces tensions. The OSCE High Commissioner on National Minorities offers guidance on how to create, nurture and develop the role of the media and information technologies for conflict prevention. The High Commissioner's Tallinn Guidelines on National Minorities and the Media in the Digital Age advise on how to implement the right to freedom of expression in diverse societies and enable access to a wide range of media and information technologies without discrimination. Avoid hostility towards national minorities by refraining from and by countering hate speech, disinformation, propaganda or inflammatory discourse within or across borders. Support and stimulate media and information technologies so that they can better cater for the linguistic, cultural and other needs and interests of national minorities. And create and sustain a favourable environment for pluralistic debate in the digital age in which members of all groups in society can participate. Okay. So thank you very much again. Let's have a picture all together. If you stand up, we'll put the photographer here. Thank you. Yes, good. Oh, lovely. There we go. Well, first of all, let me begin by saying welcome. I'm Jennifer Jackson Priest, and it is my pleasure to be able to chair what I'm sure is going to be a very lively and dynamic conversation. Lively and dynamic because I am joined by a fantastic group of experts. We have Tarlik McConagall, who's a school researcher and lecturer from the Institute of Information Law at the University of Amsterdam. Dr. Andre Richter, who is a senior advisor from the OSCE representative on freedom of the media. Irena Kausar, who is head of the Integration Foundation here in Estonia. Eric Ross, who is chairman of the board of the Estonian Public Broadcasting. And Dr. Katrin Tildenberg, who is associate professor of visual culture and social media here at Tallinn University. So welcome, everyone. Equally, and I'm delighted to be able to say this, we are embracing the spirit of the Tallinn guidelines this morning. We are in a wonderful, eclectic space. Uh, we have this fantastic combination of cozy and quaint with very high tech. There are smart tables seated in front of everyone and around cozy sofas and chairs. But we aren't just here in Tallinn in this wonderful real space. We are also live 
in cyberspace, we hope all across the 57 member states of the OSCE, and we are going to be engaging in this new digital environment as we go through today. So you'll see at various points that we will have questions, and I'll be using my digital device to get at them, uh, coming in from online. Uh, we are also going to have video links with experts in far-flung places, so we're hoping this is going to be fast-paced uh, and very lively. And to kick us off, Tarlik, I wonder if you could bring us up to date in terms of, kind of where we are now from where we've begun. Uh, my joke of the day, by the way, quick internet search using my digital device, 2003 was the launch of something that was called Face Mash. I've never heard of it until I did the look. A year later, it was renamed Facebook. So imagine that, the same year as the previous guidelines, and here we are, and I wonder if you can bring us up to date with the new ones, Tyler. Well, I, th I think you've answered your own, your own question there, and the uh, exhilarating pace of technological change is what, uh, as the High Commissioner mentioned in the high-level introductory panel, is what has been the driver of these guidelines. When the uh, 2003 guidelines were drafted and completed, um, with their primary focus on the electronic or broadcast media, as they were so commonly known. Uh, even when the ink was drying on the page, technology was moving forward, and that, uh, that technological progress has continued relentlessly ever since. So now we're no longer in a media environment, but in a multimedia environment. And uh, as the High Commissioner mentioned this morning already, uh, these guidelines seek to provide a, a, a practical tool, or I would say toolbox, uh, for states, but also for a broader community of interested uh, parties uh, to try and um, move, if you, if you will, from the international and, and European legal and political standards concerning freedom of expression and minority rights, and to turn them into something operational. Uh, something practical, something that can be used uh, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's this big movement uh, that you see in the guidelines from uh, uh, high principles, uh, if, if you will, pie in the sky for some people, but to make them relevant uh, and to bring them uh, down to something that's practical on the ground. Um, so I, I also tried to embrace the spirit of the guidelines in preparing, you know, what is the key, uh, what, what are the guidelines trying to do in, in, in terms of their key message and, and, and their key ambition. And I thought it would be very clever if I could present that key message in 280 characters, the length of a standard tweet. But that, was, that, that proved to be a very frustrating exercise because there's a lot in there. There's 37 uh, guidelines spread over four main pillars. Um, and and uh, in the end, uh, I, I, I thought I came up with a clever solution because I recalled that on Twitter, you can also do a thread of tweets to create more space for your message. And I think that's something that taps into what the President and, and, and the Minister for Foreign Affairs said this morning. It's wonderful in this digital age that we have all of these technological opportunities, and indeed Estonia has been a leader in, in securing uh, universal access to the internet as a, as a starting point for, for uh, participation in democratic society. But the opportunities in and of themselves are not enough. We have to ensure that everyone, male, female, member of a majority community or a minority community, is equipped with the skills that they need to make effective use of this abundance of, uh, of, of opportunities that are, that are available to us. So you can call it media literacy, uh, media and information literacy, computer literacy, digital literacy, the name doesn't matter, but it's the uh, acquisition of that set of skills, um, critical and, and also technological, that, that is crucial. Um, maybe the key message in 280 or so characters is that these guidelines seek to impress on states the importance of honoring their international and, uh, and European and OSCE commitments to ensure that there is a favorable environment for freedom of expression and participation in public debate for everyone and that everyone can participate in that critical debate uh, that, that, the, that the President uh, referred to this morning I in an equitable way, in a fair way, and that they can, they can do so freely, safely, and without fear. And central to the guidelines is that the media, old and new, 
are central to, to that in enabling environment. There has to be pluralism. There has to be uh, a shared forum in which different groups can speak to each other, express their ideas, <coughs> articulate their identities. And in the absence of such a shared forum, you will very quickly have problems with, with filter bubbles and, 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 and echo chambers. And these are real challenges to integration in diverse societies. So just to conclude then, um, because we've got great experts uh, waiting to, to get their points in, I think, I think these, these uh, guidelines are, are rich in detail, rich in ambition, and rich in potential. And the invitation to everyone present and the broader community out there is to explore the detail because the starting point is the experiences of the uh, HCNM's office but also the international standards and um, what the guidelines try to do is take those standards and experiences as their starting point and try to present a range of tools that might may be useful for taking things further for improving the situation for creating opportunities to advan advance all of this and um, I think it's, uh, although the, the, the guidelines are directed primarily at states, there's really a very important role to be played by a wider community and including the internet uh, corporations that have become so powerful as gatekeepers in uh, today's multimedia environment. And as for the ambition, um, as I say, it shouldn't be a castle in the clouds. It should be something that is practical and effective on the ground. And that will only happen if uh, everyone, uh, you know, uh, invests in their promotion and uh, ensures a good uptake. And as for the potential, well, that has to be realized. That won't happen on its own, and it requires an effort from, from everyone involved. Thank you, Tarlac. Well, I'm sure your Twitter follower count is going to go up now as everyone waits to see this tweet, um, series of tweets. <laughs> um, I want to pick up one of the points that you made because you rightly emphasized that a significant core of the endeavor here was to really build on existing OSCE commitments and to be directed at the OSCE member states. Now, I know, of course, Andrea, you are actively involved in the OSCE space, looking at questions around freedom of the media, and I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how you see the guidelines feeding into the sort of work that your office does. Well, uh, thank you, Jennifer. Good morning. Uh, it's it's a, in my personal view, it, it's a very important document. It has, it is very much multi-layered, in, in in several senses. I represent a sister institution to the High Commissioner on National Minorities, the Office of the Representative on Freedom of the Media, and we are, we have different mandates, uh, but complementing each other in order to sustain uh, comprehensive security in Europe. Uh, and, and Helsinki is based on the principle of uh, human dimension as one of the major factors of, of security in Europe. As, as a person who is not with the High Commissioner on National Minority, I have a very strong temptation uh, to change the title of the uh, guidelines and to take away the word national here, uh, because in my view, what applies to national minorities in the document should apply to any minority in, in, in society. And um, at least for our office, that will be the guideline, one of the guidelines of the, of the document that, uh, uh, that is uh, proclaimed today. Um, all types of minorities deserve the treatment as envisioned in the guidelines. And when we talk about the human rights, including uh, the right to freedom of expression, which we are uh, mandated to guard and, and to promote, the right is usually defined as the right of everyone. Tarlach already mentioned that. Everyone has a right to freedom of expression, has a right to freedom of information. And the, the choice of the word everyone in international documents, in national constitutions, is not incidental. It means it's not the majority, it's not all have the right. It's not the population, it's not the nation. It's indeed everyone, and uh, including the uh, minorities uh, of all sorts. And um, by definition, minorities are weaker than majorities, and, and therefore they need, again, through the same definition, stronger protection in exercising of their right uh, uh, to, f uh, to free expression and uh, right to access to information, access to communication means, etc., etc. Today, we often hear that the human rights that exist offline should be as much protected online. In a way, uh, speaking in Estonia, uh, 
uh, I think that uh, we, we can also say that the rights that exist online should be as much protected offline today. Because, I mean, with a mix of offline and online rights, we, we, and living in the digital world, we should really think about how the rights that we exercise online should be also uh, respected um, uh, offline. We got pluralism and freedom of the media and diversity of the media. And um, pluralism is not about the numbers. It's not about the number of users. It's not about the number of um, newspapers, uh, TV channels, etc. Pluralism is about hearing the voice of the minorities. Pluralism is about not keeping them in isolation, uh, be it uh, geographical isolation, political isolation, social isolation, and, and pluralism is about involving uh, minorities in the in the dialogue in society. And uh, I'm glad to see such ideas also in the guidelines. So, in, in, in for example, in recommendation 12 and 17, I, I looked through the text so yesterday. That's why I have some numbers as well. And, and one, one other important thing that uh, we try to promote through our work is that uh, human rights is about obligations of the state of, of, of different types. It's not just obligation of the state not to interfere with the human rights of, of freedom of expression. It's also about the obligation of the state not to allow non-state actors interfere with the human rights. And again, the uh, recommendations uh, such as recommendation 10 or 18 speak about the role of the state in, in dealing with intermediaries, internet intermediaries, or, or dealing with media concentration issues uh, of, of private companies. The state has not just a role here, it, the state has an obligation here to guarantee that freedom of expression that exists in international documents and in and, and national law is also respected by private entities. And the third, or the third element of the obligations of the state, which is often forgotten, uh, is that the states should enable everyone to exercise their uh, right to freedom of expression and freedom of the media, in particular through enabling to produce content, through enabling of uh, uh, access to uh, frequencies uh, when, well, when we speak about broadcasting, uh, when, when enabling them to use the language uh, of their choice, etc., etc. And all these elements are also in the recommendations, and I, I refer to recommendation number 13 and the recommendation number 26 in particular. Uh, one important obligation which I was very much happy to see in the, in the text of the recommendations is uh, a recommendation that the states have an obligation to develop media literacy. Uh, and uh, media literacy is very important in the context of, of national minorities uh, and national minorities' rights and the uh, use of, of digital media, uh, because minorities are often ignored in the drive to enable population to analyze media and to um, be uh, be able to understand media content. And it is very important that uh, minorities in their own languages uh, are enabled to do uh, such a thing. Uh, it is important for the minorities, but it's also, also important for the uh, nations at, at large. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. I think you make a very important point, which is, of course, that the guidelines are indeed relevant to everyone. And I think in particular, we see this when we ask questions around integration. And obviously integration involves not only minorities, but also majorities. And there is a strong sense, I think, where we can read the latest guidelines in the context of the Ljubljana guidelines mm -hmm. on the integration of diverse societies. Irina, I know you work very extensively on questions around integration. And I wonder if you could say a few words about how you look at the role of the media in integration in Estonia. Yes, of course. Uh, I think that we, we are all uh, in, in, in one sphere that we are we're sure that media play in everyday life very, very important role and the influence is very, very big. Uh, it's clear that media is like mirror of society. It's, uh, it's true, the media plays a major role in the field of integration. Uh, I can speak about Estonia, uh, but I think that, uh, that other countries uh, uh, more or less in the same situation. Uh, 
Uh, our study shows that uh, society in the country, in the Estonia, uh, is growing more and more cohesive, but unfortunately we still have two different society. It's language society, it's cultural society, educational, uh, it's labor market, and uh, all uh, of these areas uh, life are close linked, and uh, of course media among uh, them. Uh, local media uh, is available in Estonia uh, in Estonian and in Russian and increasingly also in English too. Uh, but in um, uh, regions uh, that are home to a larger number of Russian speaking people, the local media is predominantly in English, uh, not in English, not yet, <laughs> in Russian and in Estonia. Uh, Everyone enjoys equal opportunities to consume the media they prefer, it's, uh, it's clear. Uh, there is no discrimination in this regard. Uh, and uh, what is a very good point, I think, that state uh, itself has contribu contribute to the creation of media channels uh, in different languages. Uh, for example, Radio 4, very popular uh, Russian-speaking radio in, in, uh, in Estonia or ETV+. Uh, it's, uh, it's more and more popular too. Um, I think that differences in media uh, consum consumption arise from the fact that uh, Russian speakers exist within the three separate uh, inform information space. It's Russian media, Estonian Russian language media, and Estonian language media. But uh, Estonians usually they are only in one information space. This is Estonian language media. Of course, we have international media, English media. Uh, for younger people, it's more and more available. And uh, I think that main picture in Estonia, it, uh, it is um, almost 70% of uh, Russian-speaking population of the country uh, watch Russian uh, TV channels. Uh, in, in their everyday life, and uh, at and the same time, uh, almost 85% uh, of Estonian-speaking population uh, uh, use Estonian language uh, channels. And uh, this led to a situation where the information being provided about key Estonians, uh, Estonian and uh, world events sometimes a little bit different, uh, especially when I speak about uh, news about Russian, Russia. Uh, however, I think that very positive uh, trend is that at uh, local level, both Estonians and Russian exist uh, within quite a similar information space, meaning that uh, local media plays a very significant role, not only state media, but uh, local media. Uh, for example, media in Northeast Estonia or Southeast Estonia, we have different uh, newspapers, re radio channels, TV channels too. Uh, uh, almost 85% uh, uh, of both Estonians and Russians claim to be uh, well informed about uh, local issues. And this is same information, not different information. Um, the importance of the media in the field of integration has all, uh, also been demonstrated in studies. Uh, the more that people are included and involved in society and the state uh, in Estonia, the greater they trust in local Estonian and Russian language media, uh, both. This is, of course, two-way process. Uh, those who, uh, who find themselves more often within national information space become more positively uh, disposed toward Estonia, uh, and people who are more loyal to the country look beyond national channel for information. Uh, some worries, <laughs> maybe. Uh, what is worrying in Estonia is the fact that issues uh, are sometimes uh, reported in Estonia and Russian language media uh, in differently, different ways. This is, I think this is not uh, necessarily done in bad faith. I, I, I believe that uh, it's, it's not uh, um, bad things, uh, but uh, uh, headline self. Uh, and since Estonian and Russians has, it exist within separate uh, social space, both media strive to generate, generate uh, messages that their target audience will buy. Uh, as a result, people understand the situation sometimes differently. 
uh, and it can increase uh, the difference in understanding, like close ring. Uh, of course, media literacy, it's very, very important. We have cross-curriculum topic in now a national curriculum. Uh, I think this is good. We have some subjects. It, uh, it's um, um, it's uh, good prepared that now our teachers uh, are prepared, but it is clear that more needs to be invested in the field uh, uh, so to young people in the country become more critical media consumers, uh, gaining analyzing skill, asking more meaningful questions, and etc. Et the fact that younger are no longer simply consumers but uh, have also become producers like uh, social media, YouTube, etc., also needs to be taken uh, into account. Uh, in summary, these three points, uh, for my opinion, is very important. That means that uh, first is in Estonia reinforcing local channels, including uh, regional media. It's, uh, it's very important. Uh, cooperation between Estonian and Russian-speaking journalist, journalists in Estonia, the more they work together, the more similar the messages will come that the med media sends out. And media literacy, I think this is very, very important for both Estonians, Russians, Ukraines, not both, but, but, but for, for all national minorities, I think that uh, we can do uh, more and more for young people in this field, uh, but uh, I think that uh, we have to do not only for young, young, young people, because uh, I think that sometimes adults <laughs> need maybe more this kind of uh, support. Thank you, Irina. Uh, Eric, you know, you're wonderfully placed in a way to bridge the gap between the old guidelines directed at broadcast media. And, you know, you're a broadcaster here on the panel. I wonder what your sensibility is around the possibilities, but the challenges as well, in terms of broadcast media and integration here in Estonia, building on what Irina has just said. Mm -hmm. Well, um, uh, actually, I, sh I should say that there is a um, uh, uh, both positive trends and, and examples uh, I can I can draw draw in, but also a um, uh, lot of challenges actually. So if we start from uh, positive things, then uh, I think we have we have passed quite a long way in the sense that uh, uh, here we settle a standard uh, in in media and in journalism. And now I can say that uh, it took like 20 years or something, but uh, but despite the, the language what any journalist uh, is using in Estonia. Uh, they have common understanding how what is quality journalism, how it must be done, and, and uh, also, uh, also we a little bit uh, having, having been a very, very uh, first or also in public uh, commenting platforms, uh, which is also uh, quite unique uh, globally that, that everybody can, uh, could, could comment uh, freely without any control uh, already like 20 years. Now it's rather um, getting uh, less and less possible with, with many reasons. However, this, uh, I see that the best thing we achieved is actually that uh, there is no difference uh, how our journalist works and, uh, and it, it means that there is no, uh, at least uh, not only in public, uh, public service media but also in commercial media, big, uh, big uh, players, there is no such uh, uh, threats that uh, that big uh, main media platforms trying to manipulate uh, population or, or audience. So, so I think this is very important. Uh, however, we um, how we like uh, think what what we think, what we how we comment uh, the issues. As a sample, uh, Fox Media or Washington Post differences, for example, just as a sample, these type of things or, or uh, blames uh, we don't see in here. So these, these main positive things, what we, uh, we created, I believe, from kind of the management side. Now, if uh, we watch challenges, then the, uh, uh, that challenge is, is a bit like funny even to say uh, that um, uh, with offering already uh, three years uh, uh, in two main languages, Estonian and Russian, uh, all media and information and also entertainment uh, in all platforms, including TV, radio, uh, internet, 
uh, internet news, uh, entertainment portals. Uh, however, the, uh, there is a there is a reality that uh, to, to change users' uh, commitment and habits is very complicated. Uh, and it, it seems to be that it, it sometimes it's in media sphere it's even more complicated than in other consumer uh, areas. So uh, our challenge, uh, especially in public uh, public media, is is quite uh, quite uh, strange in this sense that uh, in if. Would, would also we try that we, we do some in some extent we marketing or promote our services and 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 our our products but in media sphere it's totally different than in in some uh, domestic chemistry because uh, or, or kind of consumer goods because uh, immediately if you are a little bit too aggressive uh, it could be and will be uh, translated as a propaganda so in this sense, in this sense, this is main challenge actually uh, right now, at least I can say in, in Estonian, uh, Russian speaking media, that uh, that in order if you want to persuade people to use that more, then immediately they might have some some kind of hesitations about that. What what is our our aim of that? So it's it's uh, however this is kind of thing what how I how we see it and how we feel it, but uh, it's also improving. And um, just one, one number or one sample that uh, last October, for three months ago, for example, uh, local public uh, ETV Plus, which is local Russian uh, language uh, TV channel, first time uh, ever, uh, reached number one position in, uh, in uh, number of reaching to audience in Russian uh, language audience. It, it means that the share is still relatively small, so the, the uh, uh, number how often daily basis uh, Russians use this is not uh, well big enough as we as we expect and hope to be to ha to be and to have, but still uh, this type of uh, challenge or, or problem we uh, we faced uh, let's say first three years in this channel that uh, we had hypothesis that people just don't know that this channel exists or whatever. Now we uh, we actually saw that they all know the button number in the in the remote control and and they found it but uh, uh, it takes just time to change uh, consumer habits we must take one more uh, last thing that um, that also this target group and consumers um, by age is uh, really relatively old also so majority of tv consumers and also radio consumers are uh, up to 50 years old so and of course as i understand being also in this old already that the change our habits is, is quite uh, not so easy, and that you don't even have to do it, or you don't like to do it. So this main main challenge, what we have, and we're working in it, at, I believe that it just takes time, and uh, if something doesn't happen, uh, something uh, accidentally or, or something something really bad, then I believe that within few years uh, we also can can take this uh, this gap and and. Uh, we cannot, we, we cannot even say that there is different opinions in this pattern. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the whole question of users, of course, and users and producers and the blurring between the two of them is pivotal in all of this. And when we have the traditional broadcast media, there was a clear gatekeeping function that could be had through editorial control and so on. But as Amina has already said, when we get into the new social media space, that disappears. Um, and I'm wondering, therefore, Katrin, if you could say a little bit about how you see Estonia in the context of the challenges of new media, social media, you know, we've already referenced the bubbles and the echo chambers. Well, how do you see that playing out here? Um, I think before we get to the specific Estonian case, we need to think a little bit about the kind of broader situation, which is arguably the same globally because these players are global, right? So I was really um, happy to see uh, multiple references to internet intermediate or intermediaries in the guidelines, but I think it's really important now then for all those um, states or institutions who try to take up the guidelines and operationalize them um, to think of how to actually bring some of those guidelines towards intermediaries to life because the reality of the fact is that these are privately owned corporations that have more power and more money than many nation states, right? 
Um, so how do we get from kind of um, imploring them to have goodwill to actually thinking about how to regulate their, uh, them uh, or thinking about how their responsibility should grow proportionately um, to their size, especially as they, as we see, increasingly displace other um, central venues or values for public life. So we should be thinking about whether their monopolistic power, which we see accumulating as some social media platform owners buy other applications or platforms, um, in particular areas of public life, um, if that can be avoided, right? And um, these are, you know, a little bit pie in the sky because I don't have the answers in how these can be avoided, avoided but I know that a lot of um, my colleagues who are working on this internationally are trying really hard to think of um, different solutions, including social media alternatives or alternative social media platforms, um, et cetera, et cetera. Because what we need to understand is that the internet intermediaries or social media platforms, right, which are internet intermediaries per se, what their central offer is, is that they um, host and organize user content for public circulation without having produced it or without having commissioned it, right? And this is um, a very... Um, privileged position in terms of existing regulation because a lot of existing regulation is about responsibility for things that you express, right? But they don't express anything. They just host and aggregate and share it. At the same time, if we look at the impacts of the content that is shared and how it is shared, then it's clear that they are not that social media platforms are not just neutral tubes through which information flows, right? They have immense power over what is visible, what is not visible, what is uh, kind of amplified or what becomes viral, what, what is hidden, where or around which topics do networked publics form and which ones are kind of tampered down at very initial stages, right? So it is actually not true that they are merely an architecture or a structure that we fill with stuff and we have to be responsible for the stuff. So it's a very complicated issue um, to operationalize. Wow, well, that's so beautifully put. I mean, I'm sure as the audience has seen and as I've been listening to all of you, you've really done a fantastic job of communicating the sense of complexity of trying to do justice to rights and to respect in the context of this new environment, you know, where we have on the one hand great freedom, great opportunity, but on the other hand coming with it a need for great responsibility and making sure that we utilize the good you know, without getting mired in some of the negative problems that could come with it. Um, I want to open it up now to the audience. Um, questions for our panelists? Well then, at this point, you will see me reaching to my device. This is, of course, another sign of our age. Uh, by the way, fun fact, the first iPhone, there actually was an iPhone 1, believe it or not, launched in December 2007. So, and now we can't go anywhere without them. So, I'm going to open up my device and pull us out a question. And, oh, well, this is an interesting one. Um, Irina, I think this one would be perfect for you. We have here a comment which says that um, Estonia has been conducting integration monitoring for a number of years. Uh, what do the results show in terms of media consumption among national minorities and majorities in relation to integration? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, so we have integration uh, monitoring. Uh, this is uh, research. Uh, we, uh, we do this uh, each two years and, uh, and we can see uh, uh, in each, each research uh, later, we can see that our uh, Russian-speaking population and Estonian-speaking population, uh, they move close to each other more and more. Uh, they are more and more use same uh, media sphere. Uh, especially young people, especially in social media, because uh, um, 
Estonians a little bit more in, in, in Facebook, but uh, approximately 50% of uh, our Russian-speaking uh, young people uh, now in Facebook too. And uh, of course they have other, other social media channels too. Maybe I am not, I am not a specialist in this because I use only Facebook. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but uh, if we speak about uh, uh, TV channels or radio channels, Channels. Of course, young people uh, today don't use uh, TV channels, uh, uh, but it is not a uh, problem, integration problem. It is, it is uh, social media and other question. And uh, more and more uh, Russian-speaking uh, population uh, use in their everyday life our Estonian uh, Russian-speaking media. Uh, more and more, of course, Estonian-speaking media too, because I, see, I think that uh, uh, one now a success story is that more and more uh, young people can speak Estonian fluently, and when they can speak Estonian language, of course, they choose Estonian uh, channels uh, too. Uh, of course, in our everyday li life, uh, especially before election, we have election uh, in March, uh, in early of March, and. Uh, uh, of course, this topic again and again very interesting for for all all uh, all politicians and uh, and uh, other people. Uh, but I think that um, uh, but topic integration is uh, are, are we, we successful integration in integration policy or not? And uh, I am uh, I, I believe that uh, we are quite successful. And uh, like I said, our people can speak more and more uh, Estonian language. And uh, what is very good uh, tendency, in my opinion, that uh, approximately 85 percent of uh, young people uh, feel that Estonia is their homeland. Uh, it's uh, Russian-speaking uh, young people. And if they feel that Estonia is their homeland, of course they are interested in, in this media, of course they are interested in, 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 in social media to be connected with Estonian young people. Of course they use more Estonian uh, radio and TV channels too. And uh, I think that this is my, and regional regional um, media. I, I told a little bit uh, in in my uh, previous uh, speech, and I think that this is uh, uh, very important too. That uh, people in uh, in regional areas in northeast Estonia, for example, uh, they are in same uh, information environment. Uh, they know uh, local is issues in same way, and this is tendance more and more uh, we are in in same uh, influence but of course we have challenges too and the challenge of course uh, uh, to uh, maybe not not after two years, maybe after ten years, I can and I can say that our all people in one media sphere in Estonia. I don't know it's it's uh, it's possible or not, but uh, I, I I would like to believe this. It's fantastic. There's lots of interest online, actually, in Estonia, which is great to see. It's clearly an interesting case. Um, I'm being signaled that we have a video engagement coming up next, so I think we're going to play a video. Uh, and again, further evidence of us embracing the new digital reality. I think it's about to play. This is, of course, dramatic pause <laughs> for effect. Ah, here we go. Uh, okay. I hello? Think, yes, hello. Hello. Uh, Tom, can you hear me? We can. We can hear you, and we can even see you. So welcome, um, and hello from Tallinn this morning. Um, and I think that I hope that you have been listening on the live streaming. Um, and I wonder if we can now bring you into the conversation. Yes, uh, first of all, thank you for a very interesting discussion and for many, many uh, very uh, relevant points. Uh, and also, thank you for these guidelines because they are, of course, a very, very welcome updating of uh, earlier instruments in this field, uh, particularly if we compare them to the earlier guidelines on broadcasting, the whole concept of media is now broader, much broader than before. Uh, we can see the same development for example, uh, when we look at what is going on 
in the Council of Europe uh, when we look at, for example, monitoring of the uh, Charter for Regional or Minority Languages. But I would have a question relating to this, because much of the discussion so far has been on skills, competencies, and that is use and demand. Uh, and and uh, as I see it, the uh, uh, technical development that we see is much, much broader than media today, as we understand media today. We have uh, such things as uh, the Amazon Alexa and things like that are co that are coming into, into the picture. And uh, we see a future where so much of everything we do will be done over what then could be media. And my question actually to, to, to uh, Dr. Uh, Tala McGonagall and to, to uh, Dr. Richter, Andre Richter, would be uh, how long will it take until we need to further develop our definition of media from what we do now? Uh, because mm -hmm. as uh, already uh, uh, President Kalilait uh, expressed, uh, this is an important, so important part of, uh, of uh, activity in society today that, uh, that people are invited from the point of view of supply, that they, they have a supply that they can relate to, for example, in their own languages, over all the different platforms that are emerging. And I would claim that what we see is a total change of society, not only of the media sector. Could you please comment on this? Well, fantastic. So already a pitch for a third media guidelines, perhaps. I don't know who would kind of care to answer Tom's question first. Yep. Well, of, of course, the facetious answer would be, yes, we have to keep it interesting and we have to ensure that there's uh, work to be done in the, in the future as well. But I, I think you're, uh, more seriously, I think your, pot, uh, your, your point is, is absolutely spot on. Thank you. The, um, the changes that we see taking place before our very eyes are... are very, very fast, they're very ongoing. It's very difficult to predict where they will lead to. I think, um, it, you know, to, to address your, your point and your concern, it's important maybe to stand back from this immediate set of guidelines and position them in the uh, longer cycle of thematic uh, work by the High Commissioner's Office, uh, because previous focuses in that body of thematic uh, work includes uh, effective participation and integration in diverse societies. And the, the, f the scope of those uh, um, 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 thematic initiatives are, are, is broader. So there's, and, uh, and I think this was one of the aims of the, of the current guidelines, there is a complementarity between them. So whereas the, f the, the present guidelines focus on media in the digital age, um, there is indeed, as you say, a broader, a broader context of technological change, which has implications for e-governance and, uh, and a range of other uh, uh, concerns. Um, so I think there are some references to um, the, the broader context in the guidelines, in, 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 in particular e-governance, e but I, I, think, uh, I, I think it's very important uh, what, what you've just said about um, keeping an eye on these developments and seeing if there are particular angles from the perspective of the HCNM and uh, the, the mandate of the office to, to intervene, to supplement these, these further. Uh, and, and I think that's maybe one of the um, nice challenges uh, that we face. I mean, the, these standards will 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 undoubtedly be 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 supplemented in in the future, uh, but these are very issues that are very much alive, and uh, we have to be we have to be vigilant about them. Yeah, uh, I would like to add briefly. Uh, while I agree with Starlock that observing the rights of national minorities in the media is an ongoing process, and it, it will develop uh, together with the development of technologies. From, a, from the perspective of freedom of the media, uh, there is not big change. I mean, if you look at the guidelines for broadcasting and the current guidelines, they're not dramatically different. And from the point of freedom of the media, media is not just a new gadget or another gadget. Media is a, is a generally speaking, technological possibility for a person to express himself or herself and, 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 and not just express himself or herself, but to use this technological means in order to 
be part of a meaningful political process, first of all. So freedom of the media is, is first of all, for political realization, for political uh, existence of a human. And, and therefore, the, the technological means are not so much important. Thank you. Could I just make a short comment, Andre? Because I think your uh, answer is, uh, is, to me, very, very interesting. And I would uh, consider the media sector and the developments in the media sector to be more than political. It will be a question of life and death for people in the future, whether or not they are in this uh, uh, ecosystem and if they can participate uh, uh, equally and, and effectively in the digital ecosystem. And then it, the question for me becomes a little bit broader. Hmm. Hmm. Well, if I could, in, in yeah. really in 280 characters, uh, to address both of your, your contributions, I think, you know, we, we have a fixed point on, on, our, on our horizon, and that is the international standards, the firm principles behind those international standards. But the instruments in which those uh, standards are, are enshrined are, are, are living instruments. So it's very important as technologies change that we keep those big overarching principles under review and rethink them where necessary to make sure that the rights that, that, that everyone enjoys are, are effective in practice. And uh, taking your, 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 your point uh, uh, ab about, ab about life and death, the president mentioned earlier that digital is a wonderful equalizer. I think the challenge for us, which you are adverting to, is to ensure that digital doesn't become a terrible excluder. And this is something that we have to, have to keep in, in, in mind as well. Well, thank you so thank much, you for Tom Mooring, for joining us. Um, obviously, on that point as well, as a final comment from me. You know, we're so far talking about Twitter and Facebook and so on. Big rise of things like WhatsApp where it's completely opaque, and how in the world do you monitor that? And I say this as a parent of a 13-year-old who's constantly on WhatsApp, um, so you can certainly <laughs> see the general direction of travel. Um, I'm now kind of looking out into the audience. Again, I don't know if anybody would like to come in in this lively conversation. Right. Um, right. Yes? How was that? Where? No, no, no. <laughs> Please. Thank you for this interesting uh, conversation and presentation. My name is Vitaly Popov. I'm counselor of the Embassy of Ukraine in Estonia. Uh, my question is, uh, last year, uh, probably you heard about this awful situation, Russian uh, Federation uh, made a military attack to Ukrainian seamen in, in, in Azov Sea. After this occasion, uh, Ukraine uh, had to impose some sanctions against Russian Federation, including uh, carefully check of the uh, Russian passports holders who are planning to cross Ukrainian state border. And after uh, this uh, military attack in Azov Sea, it was uh, three uh, official statements from Estonian side. The first statement was in the same day uh, from His Excellency Mr. Sven Mixer that Estonian accused this situation. Next day, uh, Monday, it was official statement of Mr. Yuri Ratas that Estonia accused the situation and uh, the, the next day uh, Her Excellency Mrs. Uh, Kersi, uh, Kersi Kaljulait also made the same uh, statement. Uh, I received a call from Estonian Road Transport Association, it's non-governmental organization, that we've got a lot of uh, drivers who are uh, holders of Russian passport and we're worrying about the possibility to cross Ukrainian border. I stress that. We are trying to do the best, but it was not our fault. It was illegal action from Russian side. And this lady stressed that, yes, we know it, because we received information from official statement of our president, official statement of our foreign minister, and our prime minister. We know what's happened. It is clear for us. From your point of view, my question is, what is the role of official politicians to create a really good society, good information, to block some so-called black mail? Is it understandable? Yes, Thank I Thank you so, so much. Uh, I don't know who would like to answer for that one. 
not really a media question. Uh, yeah, it's a media question. There is no ideal world. Uh, I mean, yeah, well. <laughs> that's probably the, 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 the answer is there is no ideal world. Of course, we would like all to be happy and free and uh, live in a democratic society, but uh, that doesn't work that way. Uh, presumably that underscores again the importance of the guidelines, giving us a kind of toolkit to deal with issues like this. Perhaps, yeah, Tarlik, well, you'd like to come in on that? Well, well, well um, the, 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 the guidelines try to um, be broad enough to, to countenance and, and, and be able to in some way deal with uh, different situations that could arise. and, and, and the situations that do arise can be very, very specific in, in terms of the factual circumstances. But one thing that is very strong, and this is uh, the driver of this, is the mandate of the, of the, of the High Commissioner, that the media, and also social media, uh, can, uh, uh, but also state officials uh, and a whole range of actors can play <coughs> crucial roles in providing quality information and diffusing um, uh, other, other, other types of information. And there, the, what's referenced in the guidelines is a raft of uh, OSCE commitments uh, which give different ways in which, uh, in, in which everybody can assume their responsibilities and in that way contribute to an environment uh, in, 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 in which there, there, there is a, a favorable exchange of, of, of views that, that isn't disruptive uh, uh, in different respects. And um, I, th I think this is one of the objectives of the guidelines as well, to sensitize all the different players to their, uh, to their responsibilities. And it's an invitation to reflect further on what practical measures they can make in, uh, take in concrete situations to, uh, to uh, make, the, make the situation uh, better. So it's the realization of the potential of these guidelines is going to be very much a work in, in, in progress, but hopefully it provides some sort of, of, of uh, reference points uh, to in, in, in inspire further, further, further action. Obviously, read in the round in terms of already existing yeah. OSC commitments. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we now have another um, colleague ready to join us. We welcome Sergio Constantine from Iraq in Bolzano. Uh, I think about to appear on our screens any second. Hello, my name is Sergio Constantine. Uh, oh, I'm I see him on the little screen. For minority rights of uh, Iraq, a uh, research center located in Bolzano, Bolzano, the capital good, of good the Italian autonomous province of South Tyrol. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate the Office of the High Commissioner and the whole team of experts who elaborated this um, really timely set of recommendations. Now, uh, speaking about the topic of the Tallinn recommendations, um, I think it goes without saying that the um, uh, Internet uh, presents some great opportunities for minorities. For example, by providing uh, platforms for social networking or by uh, supporting the use of minority languages in various fields uh, such as education. So, um, technology could be used to uh, bring minority languages to a wider audience. Uh, however, in, um, with this development of the um, uh, digital technology, we also run the risk to create some new inequalities. I think everybody is aware that uh, nowadays uh, minority media is struggling to survive all over Europe. And um, in the, the context of this so-called digital revolution, uh, minority media faces some specific challenges. And I know this uh, directly from the experience of uh, Midas, which is an association of uh, daily newspapers um, in uh, minority and regional languages, which has the headquarters here at Eurac. In fact, uh, in the last years, uh, several minority dailies uh, simply closed down and others um, announced that uh, they will uh, not be printed anymore in the future, in the near future, uh, will have uh, probably only online versions. Uh, now, my research uh, follows a comparative approach and I uh, often focus on the interplay between the OACE and the Council of Europe. And I know, for example, that the position of the Advisory Committee on the Framework Convention for the Protection of National Authorities is that um, uh, all the online media, the online uh, minority media, cannot completely replace the conventional printed media, as um, the access to internet of uh, some minority communities is uh, difficult or even impossible. Uh, and here comes my my question. Basically, I would like to ask you. Uh, how minority media organizations uh, can make the best use of the Tallinn recommendations uh, in order to 
address such specific uh, challenges linked to the ongoing process of digitalization of the printed minority media. All right, so there we have a question, you know, winding us to reflect on the continued importance of print media, um, even into the digital age. Tarnak, I think this is probably one for you again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you very much uh, for for sharing sharing these insights and and, and your question. Uh, another difficult question. I, I might just refer to some excellent work that's been done by Professor Boring, uh, our previous uh, previous uh, uh, speaker, on uh, the the complementarity of different types of media and their ability to adequately uh, serve. Uh, the, the needs and interests of uh, minority communi communities. Um, the focus of your question is on print media, and I think it's important for us to realize that um, you know, not all types of media are simply interchangeable. We use different media for different purposes, and we use them in different ways, and it's important also uh, with, with, with Andre's point earlier about pluralism being qualitative, that you've got a, a sufficient range of media available in order to meet your, your, your needs uh, as, as, a, as a minority group, but also as individuals within, within that group. I think the, um, the usefulness of, of the present guidelines would be the emphasis uh, that it places on the need to incentivize the production, dissemination, uh, and uh, promoting the prominence of minority media, including in minority languages. And again, this is something which appeals to the good offices of states and other actors who are in a position to uh, do something about it. But the fact that it's in the guidelines will hopefully provide a tool for lobbying and advocacy purposes uh, to try and, and, and uh, ensure that that would lead to meaningful support, uh, uh, ideally financial, but at, uh, if not, at least in other um, in other respects, uh, to, to ensure the vitality of, of, of print media. Um, so I hope, I hope that, uh, that it will at least provide uh, you know, a basis for uh, more effective uh, ad advocacy in, in, in that regard. I guess a part of that as well is also pointing to digital divide issues, isn't it? When in part, the saliency of continued print media you know, owes itself to the fact that not everyone can necessarily access the online world as easily as others, whether because they lack the kind of connectivity devices to do it or the infrastructure just doesn't exist in their area, mm -hmm. the high-speed kind of broadband access that you need. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously, this whole range of other issues as well um, is clearly implicit in a big way yeah. um, in terms of the guidelines also, also and what explicit. they're trying to do with. Yeah. And explicitly, absolutely. Any other questions or comments from our audience here? And if not, I will go back to the website. Um, yes, I see a hand up, and I should say, uh, please do introduce yourself before you give your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Yadian Ferenci, and I'm representing the cabinet of the Ministry of Commissioner for Neighborhood Policy, Hungary. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank all the participants for this valuable contribution uh, uh, discussion. Uh, my question would be uh, general. Uh, I see from the program that you represent the, uh, the academic sphere and the non-governmental uh, sector. So how do you see your own possibilities? And in general, how do you see the role or, and possibility of the intergovernmental sector to help the government to respect the, the recommendations uh, formulated in the guidelines or, or in more general, not only the OEC guidelines, but uh, uh, much uh, has been said about the, uh, the norms and standards of the Council of Europe. So how the civil sector, the academic field can help and assist uh, the member states to, to respect these norms. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I start us off? Please. Um, I was actually just thinking about something on those lines when I was reading the guidelines because I was looking at what was cited in the guidelines and primarily what was cited in the guidelines was other guidelines um, and not really um, academic research, uh, which I'm sure has gone into all of those previous <laughs> guidelines and this guideline as well, but the kind of explicit network of references um, and interactions is that policy documents talk to each other and academic documents talk to each other, where it is clearly, like, at least in 
this case, in the case of these guidelines, there is an abundance of cutting edge, really good quality research going on right now, both in terms of broadcast media integration and internet intermediaries. So there is research existing on all of this. And there is academics who are definitely interested in having these conversations. I am assuming that there's also government institutions who are interested in having these conversations. What um, academics can maybe bring, because guidelines are always a very macro structure. They have to be applicable across um, different conditions. Uh, so there is this necessary generalization. What can happen is that there are so many studies that are in specific countries or or international, but for very specific youth groups. For example, minority youth um, who live in intercities um, across Europe, and how do they use um, applications like WhatsApp and Snapchat, right? Uh, so these very specific lived uh, circumstances that perhaps immediately do not, the, the, the title of the research may not be this is about national minorities, but this will very fruitfully speak to the things that are in the guidelines towards operationalizing them. For example, I was thinking about this recent research that colleagues in America have um, done on uh, disinformation and misinformation and polarization on the internet and how we need to uh, look at it as a socio-technical problem that must have a socio-technical um, solution, which means that this is includes both social systems and technical systems, which means that we look at first the actors spreading misinformation or, or polarizing um, items, and we look at why they do it. And there's a lot of research on that, and we know that they do it because, uh, at least partially because it supports their pre-existing beliefs, uh, but they also do it in order to signal an identity to other people, right? So it is about them and not really about the politics. It is about how I want to be seen among other people. Then what gives the messages that are polarizing traction is that they, the ones that become popular, again, there's the swath of research on it, are the ones that engage with what are called deep stories or grand narratives of hurt and injustice to my people, whoever I consider my people to be. And then finally, there's the technical la layer, which usually is talked about using the term affordances, right? And this is where we know that algorithms um, that regulate visibility, recommendation algorithms, uh, things like that, uh, these uh, and the social sharing that is incited by the platforms because this is what makes them money, these massively increase the scale and the spread of all kind of problematic communication, right? These are theoretically three different bodies of work. Nobody expects institutions to be able to put this together, but there are academics who are already putting it together. Um, so I think there is already a lot of kind of practical or at least one step before practical information out there that just has to be utilized. Absolutely, an excellently comprehensive answer. Um, Tarlik, did you want to come in on this as well? Some of your yeah, I think if I may be so uh, forthright, I, I think this sounds like the first success story of, uh, <laughs> the first concrete success story of the launch. I, I, I appeal to everyone to view the guidelines from their own perspective and see how they can take them forward. And I think this sounds like a very concrete example of, a, uh, of more leadership coming from Estonia. You're <laughs> going to organize an academic conference <laughs> to uh, embed this in, in, a, in, a, in a broader, more academic uh, setting. Yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, there, there is a voluminous uh, uh, scholarship and a fast-growing scholarship on all of these issues, all different angles. I think primarily the format of these guidelines and previous guidelines and recommendations was such that um, it, it would be uh, quite self-referential self in terms of the standards that are out there. Uh, the driver was that these are the existing commitments of states, whether legal or political. Uh, so um, sometimes we know we're familiar with those provisions. We can quote them chapter and verse. Other times they're less familiar. Uh, we need to be refreshed uh, uh, about what they involve. But uh, I think these, these guidelines try to have a forward-looking, a contemporary and forward-looking interpretation of the standards that are there. And those standards can be very disparate. So 
hopefully they bring them together in, in a coherent way. Um, also, there was a concern not to be uh, too academic uh, in, in the sense that they have to be practical in, in, in practice, but that is in no way to downplay the importance of academic scholarship that's out there and that f informs them uh, just as the concrete day-to-day -day experiences of the High Commissioner's team uh, uh, and, 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 and contacts have, have informed them as well. So there, there are some... Uh, some limitations maybe as to the format, but there are also great opportunities for taking it forward. And I'm, I'm encouraged by your, your comments that, that, that this will happen. Um, uh, thank you. Great. Well, uh, um, briefly, and then I think I'll take another question from our website. Very Please. briefly, I think part of the question was uh, about the role of intergovernmental organizations. I think in, in this context, uh, the guidelines, first of all, gu the guidelines is, is a starting point, it's not the end in itself. I mean, this should be also understood that it, it is to provoke more discussion and, and, and more stakeholders to be involved in the process. Uh, I think the role of uh, intergovernmental organizations is to accumulate ideas on particular issues from uh, experts and, and suggest agendas for national governments in implementing or in dealing with these ideas. And in this regard, uh, I think Tallinn um, uh, guidelines is a, is a very good example. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'm conscious of wanting to make sure that we're inclusive of our online audience as well as our real space audience. Um, so I'm just going to throw out a question from online and then we will come back um, to the actual audience. Um, Eric, I think this is one for you. Um, and again, it shows how much interest there is in Estonia online. Question is, how can the media learn from the experience of some countries, such as Estonia, in countering disinformation with regard to national minority issues? Well, uh, I think a little bit it's exaggerated that to say that uh, disinformation issue is only a minority issue. <laughs> I believe it's rather, rather opposite. But of course, they are, they are parallel problems. And, uh, uh, as, I, as I also mentioned before, that I believe this kind of uh, nature, our, our main, main minority uh, background belief, if I would say so, was that uh, coming from, uh, as, as myself, uh, from Soviet uh, uh, heritage background, because in Soviet era, uh, the, the media, okay, we don't, didn't use this word at all, but journalism as it, as it is, was a part of propaganda or, or, or aim of uh, how to, uh, how to uh, explain to the nation uh, the, the goals of politicians, more or less, to say. So it's, it means that all, all the uh, older generation, generation um, uh, people who uh, has this uh, long experience, they have a bit compli complication to, to change this understanding and to understand that there is really free media. Now it's, now it's, um, now it's getting this... Uh, also, in, in um, social media uh, terms, that uh, like like it was also mentioned by Rena that uh, in Estonian case, for example, uh, more than half of uh, our minority is rather using a Russian-oriented uh, social media, namely two biggest of them of of Contact and uh, and other classic. So and and uh, and rather a younger generation like like Irena mentioned, uh, switching more and more over to Facebook. So in this sense, um, uh, it's not uh, good or bad uh, as itself, but uh, but as it was uh, told also that this kind of uh, um, let's say dispute about uh, how how platform is platform and when when until uh, this only uh, any social media is only platform and kind of aggregator. Then it's it's at, the, at least theoretically simple uh, simple way, uh, even if it's simplified. But how uh, how we see also uh, and and know uh, much better about uh, Facebook nowadays and and the the uh, main main owner and founder is uh, Mark uh, Zuckerberg also um, accepted and and acknowledged that they are uh, using algorithms to uh, to to. Uh, Present the, the information also in, in different uh, different forms and in different uh, categories. So it, it means actually that in very many cases, uh, in most cases, I, I should say, uh, this information is not wrong. But if you add this really really in long lo big proportions, uh, the one tendency, then people tend to start to believe it. So it's it's uh, it's so simple. And and I believe 
we definitely must not have so naive that we don't believe that uh, the guys in, in, in Kremlin doesn't use this uh, formula. I believe they are, I assume they're a little bit ahead actually, but we don't know that exactly yet. So in this sense, in this sense it means that all this, uh, uh, but, but the good thing I believe it's here is that uh, all these kind of tricks, is it trolley fabrics or whatever, uh, you can use only once or, or twice uh, max. So if, if we understand how it works, then they have to learn next, next manipulation uh, instruments. So in this sense, uh, we are more and more mature uh, as, a, as a consumers, also as a, uh, mediators and media players, but uh, uh, also it's very sure and certain that new tricks are waiting around the corner. So we just must be ready and we must be hesitational. In, uh, I'm a little bit uh, maybe too optimistic or, or too, too uh, 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 this way that um, that from media and journalist perspective, I, I must say also, it's, it's a little bit like uh, seeming sometimes and quite often that, uh, that this kind of lazy excuse for journalism, uh, we, uh, we had to have some, some uh, false facts or whatever. It's, uh, it is, it's a little bit excuse for doing not good journalistic work because this uh, job must be done and have, have, must be done always. So nowadays, if... Uh, everybody can be kind of social media journalist, then it's, it's also uh, it's like, like good feeling rather, but, but uh, especially younger generation journalists a little bit also allow them, uh, themselves to, to, to uh, let the standards down. Okay, I got this news from somewhere and it's okay, but it doesn't help them or it, it's not, it cannot be excuse not to work properly. And uh, I should say, at, at least in Estonia, that we, like I mentioned before, that we set the standards by the journalistic uh, managers, the chief editors, and this cannot be uh, like a let, let behind. And until you do this uh, job properly, then this threat is much, e uh, much weaker. Either it is still there. Thank you. I know we have one question over here. Do we have any other questions in the audience at this point? In which case I will gather up several. Yes, then here. And please do introduce yourself. There should be a little button. Uh, hello, I'm uh, the ambassador of Spain. Uh, my question is, uh, well, thank, I want to thank the High Commissioner and this vivid debate today here. My question is uh, on the procedure. Uh, what is, uh, because the High Commissioner said that we are, these styling guidelines are built on other guidelines, what is exactly the added value of these styling guidelines? Is it the first time that we have these guidelines on the, or the, the idea of this guidelines on the on, on digital uh, age and minorities. In that case, we are in the place, definitely Tallinn is the place to, to talk about this. And, and another thing is that, and excuse my ignorance, how binding it is for the countries. And if we have to sign, uh, the countries member of the OEC have to sign these guidelines. I mean, it's just uh, we here in Tallinn, maybe we are not so much aware of your procedure. Thank you very All much. Right, thank you. Well, Tarlak, I think these are perfect questions for you. Uh, unless the, unless High, Commissioner the High Commissioner would wish to. <laughs> um, well, I'm sure I will be corrected if I put a, a, a foot wrong. These, um, I, I, I think there, the, these guidelines are unique in terms of the breadth of issues that they try to deal with in one place. Um, so, you know, y you have various international and European standards that, that might focus on, f or have important focuses on freedom of expression or minority rights, uh, but to bring both of those big components together with an emphasis on the media, but not just traditional media, institutionalized media, but also the growing range of other media that are used to contribute to public debate or to obstruct public debate, uh, in some cases, uh, and also, and, and I think this is the real um, one of the, one of the real unique elements, the mandate of the High Commissioner to try to see how these technologies uh, can be used to prevent uh, the emergence of conflict or the escalation of conflict, or if there has been a conflict, how to resolve that conflict, and the you know the media can 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 create a shared space in which. Uh, uh, different groups can come together, 
or if there is harmful or objectionable content, it can, they, can, they can also polarize. So I think that's the terrain that these guidelines try to navigate. And your question, as the second prong to your question as to whether they are binding, no. And I don't think that, that I said they were ambitious, but they're not that ambitious. I think they're very pragmatic. They are inspired by a range of legally binding and politically binding commitments that apply to, uh, um, in, in many cases, all OSC participating states. In some cases, they may be referenced, they, they may be based on Council of Europe standards or, 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 or EU standards, so they, they, they would only be reference points rather than hard legal commitments. But that's all in the background. Uh, what, the, what the guidelines tries to do is to emphasize the OSCE commitments, which are directly relevant uh, for, uh, and, and, and a source of major guidance for all participating states. And it tries to interpret them in a way that's relevant to the subject matter and uh, with an eye on, on ongoing uh, changes. So I think there's, at, at different levels, it's quite a unique uh, coming together of, of uh, topics and standards. And the fact that they're all in, um, uh, in a one-stop shop, that they're all uh, in one place, uh, I hope will make them useful uh, and relevant to a, to a wider <coughs> community of actors. Uh, again, getting back to the toolbox uh, uh, metaphor. Right, thank you, Tarek. We are down to our final couple of minutes. Uh, I'm going to very quickly invite each of our panelists to give, this is a challenge, one minute or less, maybe it's only 60 or 70 characters, Tarek, uh, the final takeaway message, final thought you'd like to leave with our real space and cyberspace audience. Uh, and would you like to begin? We'll just go around and collect okay. them up. All right. Um one last temptation that I have uh, with the title of the uh, guidelines, I think they should be also called not just Stalin guidelines, but timely guidelines. <laughs> and I think uh, uh, in answer to your um, uh, question also, uh, Ambassador, the point is that um, international standards are there for, for decades. Interpretation of the standards to the contemporary world, that is what is important today for politicians and for the public in general. And uh, we didn't speak about it particularly during this uh, discussion, but um, the question of not just technological changes which happened in the past uh, 15 years, but also the question of political changes is very much dominant on, on what, is, what is being discussed. And um, I'm very glad that uh, the guidelines deal with the question of disinformation and propaganda which is a huge threat today to the international peace in the region, uh, an unbelievably huge threat. And, 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 and the minorities, national minorities, are very often both the target and the instrument of such propaganda and disinformation. And in this way, I'm very much happy that the uh, guidelines deal with this issue in a very thoughtful and uh, uh, balanced way. Thank you. Thank you. Irina. Yeah, we, uh, we have guidelines. Uh, implementation always is a harder and longer process right, uh, than, than write uh, guidelines. I think that, uh, like we said, this is uh, not the end, but this is only start. I believe in cooper uh, cooperation, cooperation between politicians and non-political sector, uh, cooperation because um, between uh, academical uh, sector and, and uh, uh, non-governmental uh, organization, uh, cooperation between national minorities or not national minorities, but minorities at ma and majorities. I think that it's very, very important to speak with each other about these uh, topics in these guidelines. And, uh, and um, uh, if, I, if I think about my work, uh, everyday work, uh, I can do this ki kind of, uh, of uh, uh, activities. That, yes, I believe cooperation and cooperation in implementation, this uh, good recommendations. Um, it's a toolbox, 
Um, maybe some of the tools had been mislaid. The challenge was to get as many tools into the toolbox as possible. Some of the tools needed a little bit of sharpening, some of them needed a little bit of polishing, and we needed a little bit of an instruction guide to go with the tools about how to use them. So very much in the spirit of cooperative uh, endeavor, which is also strong in the, in the guidelines. Uh, my challenge uh, for everyone, uh, the hope that I would have for the guidelines is that people start looking at the tools that are in there and thinking how could they best use them themselves in their own situations. Um, it's not like a legally binding text where everything has to be implemented, but hopefully, as one of the speakers earlier this morning said, there's food for thought and hopefully ample food for thought. Thank you for your interest. Um, kind of in line with Andre's kind of reframing, um, um, you call them timely guidelines. Um, I have been thinking ever since the question about um, uh, kind of technological um, advances about the, the connections and differences between media and mediation or media and mediated. Um, so perhaps um, these are less guidelines um, for media in the digital age, but these are guidelines for uh, public sphere um, in the networked or digitally saturated world, uh, which is partially mediated uh, and partially not, um, in some cases mediated by kind of conventional institutional media and in other cases mediated by um, communication technologies. So basically what we're talking about is we're talking about sociality and communication and interaction in this world that is inherently mediated by medias, both old and new. Thank you. Eric. Well, uh, as I'm not deeply familiar yet, so I have uh, a bit complicated to, to comment that in details, but, um, but I rather believe, yes, that uh, uh, it's good to have such kind of, of, of over, overall and, and, and uh, explanatory, quite, quite well explained also the background why this, uh, this or, or another point is here. And uh, the, uh, there is also one threat, let's say this way, that, uh, that as it's general, it, it, it must be general, otherwise it cannot be, be here. It's also, also I, I see already in the short future that uh, it, they, certain points will be uh, described uh, differently. And <laughs> both, both opponents will find <laughs> excuses from the same book, so in this sense, uh, in this sense, it's not only dialogue, but also the, the uh, dispute that is uh, following going on. But I believe still, if we have, um, if we have all this uh, material in one book, then it's very good basis where we can, at least we, have, we, we don't talk about everything in all times, but we have something and we can uh, a little bit like negotiate and improve. And I believe it's uh, the way, at least in the first glance, how it is, uh, seem to be here that it's more or less uh, most of the relevant and important things at this moment is covered, and, and it's a really good point for, to, to move on. Thanks. Well, on that note, I'm going to conclude by reminding us of the spirit of the guidelines, which the infomercial so poignantly put forward. This is an effort, of course, to create a plural space where many voices can be heard and can be respected. And I want to thank everybody who participated in, I think, a conversation that lived that reality. Our participants on the platform are conversationalists here in Tallinn in this lovely intimate space, our conversationalists online, those that joined us by video, um, obviously our very distinguished guests, the High Commissioner, the Minister, the President, and not least, clearly our wonderful panel um, who added such richness to our understanding. Uh, so thank you to everybody, um, and I think we now have the final comments, closing remarks, and the rest of us will disappear. So we've come to the conclusion uh, of, uh, of our event. Uh, I myself will put forward some uh, uh, personal considerations and uh, I will also pick on some of the issues that come up 
to, to share with you my own, uh, my own views. But before we do that, uh, we have uh, uh, a very active, engaged uh, uh, chairmanship of the OSC this year, uh, Slovakia. Uh, Mr. Uh, Lisak, who is the deputy permanent representative uh, of Slovakia to the OSC, has kindly accepted to join us all the way from Vienna today. So welcome, and I would like also uh, to give him an opportunity uh, to share uh, views of the chairmanship uh, on uh, uh, on this event and on the issues that we are uh, uh, that we have been discussing. After which I'll uh, uh, will we'll come to the concluding phase. Mr. Lisak. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. High Commissioner. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it was indeed a great uh, privilege to assist uh, at this uh, auspicious launching uh, ceremony, uh, the, the launch of uh, the Tallinn guidelines on national minorities and the media in the digital age. Uh, while thanking uh, uh, the host country for Estonia for its hospitality, uh, indeed uh, the highest uh, political level presence at this event is a testament uh, to the attention dedicated to this uh, very important agenda in the country. Uh, the mandate of, uh, of uh, the OEC High Commission uh, for national, on National Minorities was established uh, more than 25 years ago. Since then, uh, uh, five uh, different uh, commissioners have assumed, assumed the post. Uh, uh, as it was said by the foreign minister earlier, now in the current state of the world with the erosion of the long established rules-based order, the mandate is no less important than ever. Uh, the guidelines uh, introduced today are ninth in a row uh, and uh, the focus from this perspective come indeed very timely and I have to concur with uh, uh, the representative of the RFOM, uh, Andrei Richter, yes, we can call uh, this uh, also timely guidelines. You know. uh, new technologies uh, uh, indeed open vast, virtually unlimited opportunities and uh, gradually become a major economic driving force. At the same time, uh, they bring about uh, new challenges including those of, uh, of security nat uh, nature. Since the publication of the guidelines on the use of minority languages in the broadcast media in 2003, circumstances definitely have changed dramatically. Uh, on the other hand, the sound, uh, inclusive, pl pluralistic public debate, uh, public debate uh, remains very important. Uh, I was so delighted uh, the insightful expert exchange of views on the role of the media and information technologies in today's diverse societies uh, we witnessed just, uh, just before uh, was truly encouraging. Uh, the OEC chairmanship is fully aware of the very hard work uh, behind the tiny yellow book that was, that was uh, introduced today. Let me once again uh, congratulate everyone that has contributed to this collective effort and let me reassure you of uh, our continued support. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lisa. Thank you. I'll sit back down. Um, first of all, thank you. Thank you again for joining us today. It was, uh, uh, I, I think, a really interesting uh, event. Uh, but this is a beginning, in a way, of a, of a, few, of a new chapter for, for our work. I was pleased to see uh, the attendance here in the room, but also to have uh, from my colleagues uh, uh, some uh, uh, information on the online viewers, uh, which appear to have been uh, in contact with us in, in, from many, many directions, uh, not always, obviously, here uh, in Estonia, but we, we are being followed. Uh, by by uh, uh, viewers uh, in in uh, across Europe, uh, uh, from in North America, in Central Asia, uh, we have seen on our Facebook uh, page the traces of a number of uh, um, OSC uh, participating states, in fact, uh, remotely uh, following the the event. 
so I think it's it's a success, and it's it's good also to see that uh, uh, in in a digital world and with this uh, online tool, so we managed to uh, reach out such a broad uh, audience. Um, I would like to come back to the uh, one issue that was raised in particular by the, the Spanish ambassador, which is the guidelines. And no, we're not asking you to sign uh, anything here. Uh, so there is no obligation in, 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 in strict terms. This was not a, a negotiated text. It's a, it's a set of, as we uh, um, uh, call them, guidelines or recommendations. Um, but this is, as it has been pointed out, part of my, my toolbox. This is where my mandate comes in. My mandate has been agreed, negotiated, agreed, and, and signed uh, up by the countries of the OSCE. And my mandate is uh, to work towards promotion, let's put it in, in general ways, of integration, better integration in our societies, societies that are growing uh, increasingly diverse. Uh, Andre Richter, if I'm not wrong, was saying at some point we should just talk about minorities, why national minorities. I cannot do that really because my title and my mandate talk, talk about national minorities. But in fact, I stay very, uh, um, uh, very far from any attempt to define them. Uh, because minorities are in a way self-defining themselves. And one knows when one is part of a minority, whether this is ethnic, linguistic, religious, or whatever. And, and uh, there are new minorities appearing. And if we talk about, you know, for instance, social media uh, and the challenges that they pose to the traditional minorities, if you look at the new minorities, the challenges are very similar. And, uh, and the new minorities may, may in a way coalesce, co uh, coagulate in a way around certain media tools, which might uh, allow them to better integrate in the society of the countries where they live or might in a way contribute to their isolation. Uh, which can uh, influence certain ways of thinking and can influence also political processes in countries. So it is a very complicated, a very, uh, a very broad uh, uh, area where uh, we need to step, uh, uh, to step in, I think, with, uh, in a way, a certain gentle pace, but we need to raise awareness. I think that one of the important things about the debate today is really putting the issue on the table. And, and putting it with a number of recommendations. Recommendations are important uh, for me as part of my toolbox because uh, uh, as a number of people pointed out during the day, we live in an environment that is increasingly polarized. It's polarized, unfortunately, also within our countries. It's, it's politically and in many other ways. It's polarized if you come to the OSC and you sit in a meeting of a permanent council or a ministerial council, you will see how the narratives are different, how dialogue is different, how uh, much polarization in fact is affecting the political processes, the dialogue and the cooperation uh, that should be at the center of, uh, of a process like that of the CSE and then, and then, OS, and then OSCE. Uh, so one of the good things for me as I deal with issues related to minorities or to integration of societies, uh, and uh, as they get more politicized that is as a result of this polarization, uh, for me it is good to have a, tookbo a toolbox that looks a bit technical and uh, uh, so that I, I am not perceived as taking side for or against what a certain minority expects or what the king state expects me to do for that minority or what the state where the minority resides thinks that I should be doing and how I should be assessing things because I have these neutral sets of recommendations and they use them as a blueprint. As a blueprint that is not of automatic universal application that has to be adjusted every time to the local situation, to local realities, etc. Um, so for me, uh, this is useful because it allows me to step back a little bit from the, uh, polit the, the, the politics of the environment where, where I operate. Uh, but this is a tool that is not only for me because it's a tool that I recommend to each of the countries of, uh, of the OSC uh, to seek inspiration from as they develop their own uh, internal policies. So it is not only for me uh, the checklist to see how things are done and to see whether this, this works okay or not, uh, but it is also something that I would like governments to do the same and to see as we develop a policy in this or this other area, 
uh, what are the recommendations of the OSC and the I Commission of the OSC when it comes to minority issues? How can we use them to improve situation, to improve uh, um, uh, the, the processes of integration uh, in, in these diverse societies, etc.? And this is where also the, the, the external factors come in. And we, we've heard a few references to the fact that uh, uh, as relations become more complicated, minorities may be among the first to be affected and may even become tools in this. And it is important also to keep this in mind from very every angle. So here, uh, and that's why I, I look at the sets of minorities in an integrated manner um, uh, across themselves. I look at education, I look at the use of language, etc. And this is a cross-cutting issue because it has to do with the tools, uh, the tools of interaction in a way. And it's, it's also innovative in another way because as we were saying, we enter a, 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 a let, a, a, an environment that is more difficult to define, where the players are many, uh, where the structures are less clear, where the roles are less uh, obvious. So in a way, the, the clients and the addressees for these are not only the governments, of course the, the, the governments should be aware, should be part of this, but we are talking about individuals, the civil society, the corporate world. Uh, as the president was saying, we need uh, to bring in also uh, the, the private sector and some of the actors in this and the um, uh, uh, economic sphere and, and have a dialogue. Uh, about these issues. So here, this is really uh, broad and, and innovative in many ways, but it's, it's modern and it's something that uh, is a snapshot we even had to put in these, in these recommendations at some point, a, a, a clarification that these reflect the situation as of a certain date because things are moving on, world is moving on. And so we may have to figure out how we uh, make sure that over time, uh, we also uh, keep the pace with the developments outside and, and make sure this, uh, 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 that this is understood as a, as a snapshot of things as they are now and the recommendation of things as now, but it should be seen as a living document that will have uh, additional bits coming, uh, uh, coming up. One, one issue that I found interesting in the, uh, in the discussion is the question of language and how, uh, especially with minorities, um, uh, we can, and it came up also in some, uh, in some of the, um, uh, the discussions and the questions, how we can encourage also uh, um, diversity, pluralism, uh, but also the use of, uh, uh, of regional languages. Uh, on the 21st of uh, February, uh, we will have the International Mother Tongue Day. And interestingly, and you, f you will find it online if you, if you follow us, there will be a little recording, a video, coming from my office with the staff of, uh, of my office uh, uh, who will um, uh, send a message, but each of us will send only a little part of that message in its own mother tongue. And the whole thing will start with me, and uh, I confess I took the lead in this, but I will do it not in Italian, but in my own regional language, uh, just to uh, underline the importance of maintaining these, these regional languages uh, uh, vital. And, and I think we can use uh, uh, media and digital media also to strengthen this and to send messages uh, in this direction on the importance also uh, to, to preserve this uh, great richness of diversity that, uh, that we have in our, uh, uh, in our countries and in our, in our region. So messages in a way uh, of uh, uh, encouragement uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, nurture uh, this diversity as, uh, as something precious uh, that, we want, that we want to keep. But at the same time, uh, being aware of the need uh, not to be, uh, or to protect ourselves and to protect our people from uh, the, the risks of uh, uh, being somehow affected by the larger differences which are there and, and which we need to take into, into account in our work. Um, I would like to conclude uh, with uh, uh, recognition and thanks uh, to a number of uh, uh, partners that we've had in, uh, in, in launching this, uh, this event, the support of the chairmanship, of course. Um, I, I mentioned the uh, uh, 
personal role that president herself had in encouraging uh, us to go to go ahead this is a discussion we had uh, more than six months ago at the last Leonard Mary conference uh, here in Tallinn and we I think her enthusiasm uh, in a way this idea really uh, motivated us to to go ahead and uh, uh, I have to say from from that point uh, uh, ambassador Kara in Vienna uh, was uh, uh, very instrumental in, in uh, uh, helping us uh, uh, moving ahead, the foreign ministry here, uh, but also the office of the president uh, had been extremely supportive and they provided us fantastic premises. I think this, this place is really uh, the kind of thing we needed for uh, an event of this, uh, of this kind, so I was very pleased that we could, uh, uh, that we could use it. I'm very grateful. Uh, uh, for, for having a, uh, had it at our, at our disposal for the, for the event. Uh, the local partners, the Estonian Institute of uh, Human Rights, the Integration Foundation uh, in particular, uh, I'm also grateful for um, uh, their support. It's, this is only, uh, how can I say, one step in a longer term, uh, very positive and very interactive uh, relationship, and I'm looking forward also with them to continue. And also in this uh, occasion to continue a visit uh, to, the, to the country to engage also with some uh, actors on the ground on, on issues, uh, uh, including the ones we have been uh, discussing, uh, discussing today in general on issues of, uh, uh, of integration. Uh, the panelists, uh, the panelists are also very representative of the group of people who uh, engaged with us in uh, um, in developing uh, this event, uh, uh, Tarlak McGonagall needs a, uh, deserves a special mention in this because he uh, carried uh, uh, a heavy weight and uh, has a great, uh, great uh, uh, role in, in uh, making this happen, so I'm very grateful to him uh, personally, but to everybody. Jennifer, thank you also for moderating, uh, moderating the, the panel today. Um, I would like also to mention in this regard the current uh, uh, a project coordinator in Ukraine, who is a former director of my office, Eric Vilatsen, who joined us from Kiev for this event, but he was one of the initiators of this project. So thank you, thank you, Enric, also, also to you. And to all, uh, all of you and, uh, uh, and the many ones who followed us online, thank you very much. As I said, this is a beginning, now the hard work is coming. Thank you. <laughs>